Okay, so we've had some fun with handcrafted products and 3D printed products. Some people will be happy to stop there and make a living selling those kinds of items. But if you really want to take the world by storm, you're going to need to create something more unique and you're going to need to mass manufacture it in big enough quantities so that you can get it into stores and generally start making lots of money from it. So where do we start? Of course, we start with the idea. This is going to be the hard part for some people and that's what will often be a stumbling block. To create something that will be successful, you need a unique idea with a USP, that's a unique selling point. You're probably not going to be able to compete with the big businesses on price or marketing, so you need to come up with something original or you need to use savvy marketing. To come up with something original, you should still try to think about the buyer persona, the person that you're targeting with your items. What markets do you have good access to? What channels can you utilize to get your items out there into the real world? Once you know this, you can start to think about what category of product you want to create. It's always best to create what you know. In other words, fitness products are best designed by the genuine fitness freaks of the world. From there, try to think about your own pain points. Think about common frustrations or irritations you have and then think about how you're going to solve them in a unique way. This is called scratching your own itch. Other ways you can try to come up with new ideas in a given niche is to try combining two previous successful products. Alternatively, think about something really cool that everyone undoubtedly wants but isn't possible yet and then try to find out what the closest thing to it is that you could make. But if none of this works, then you can go down the route of creating a tried and tested product and there's actually nothing wrong with this approach. If you have a dedicated audience on your website or if you're able to source your products cheaply, then you can simply market yourself and sell something with your unique design, your unique logos, etc. Coming up with just an idea, though, is not enough. What you also need to come up with is an actual product, as in you need to know how that idea is going to work. Once you've done your design on paper, you need to think about how it will actually operate and how you'll be able to produce it. Enter design engineering. Design engineering is perhaps best explained as being the nexus where design and engineering collide. In other words, this is where the line becomes blurred between form and function and where engineering decisions are going to start directly impacting on the user experience and the functionality of the process. Industrial designers will often be responsible for the aesthetic and the ergonomic aspects of a design, whereas the design engineer will then work with the engineers and designers to create a much more detailed set of designs outlining how all this will work. If you imagine any new product, then it's easy to see why there would be a need to go backwards and forwards between the designers and the engineers. Imagine, for instance, a new computer. The design team might have an idea for how this should look and interact with the user, but they're going to be limited by the electronic engineers who know how large the components are going to be, how hot the device is going to get, etc, etc. Design engineering will often follow the engineering design process, which consists of several steps. First will come research, which involves looking at the literature and research as it relates to the target market, to previous products, etc. From here will come feasibility, at which point the feasibility of the proposed project is discussed with the additional information now provided by research. A feasibility study will not simply define a project as feasible or not, but it will also look at how it could be altered to come in under budget, to be functional, etc. etc. This narrows the scope of the project and leads to a further design phase. Conceptualization starts next and will usually involve a concept study where the project is planned and different ideas are discussed. This step helps to minimize error and improves the project's chances of success ultimately. Some different tools are sometimes used to help with this stage. These tools are intended to aid ideation and thus to encourage the flow of new ideas through trigger words, brainstorming and cinetics. 
From here, you establish design requirements and create a preliminary design with basic schematics, diagrams and layouts. If this is successful, then the preliminary design can move into a detailed design, which can also include the creation of prototypes, models and drawings. In this stage, CAD, Computer Aided Design, can be used to stress test the project to an extent and to find ways to reduce the costs by removing materials without negatively impacting on resilience. Finally, this moves on to production planning and tool design, the creation of the tools needed for production, and ultimately the production of the project. This might seem like a lengthy process, but ultimately it is these crucial stages that help to prevent issues down the line and thus keep profits high. Starting to feel your stress levels rise? Well, don't worry. I've used all the technical terminology here just to make sure you understand the process in detail and you can discuss it if necessary. But if you're planning on manufacturing everything yourself, then it's actually sufficient to do all these things vaguely. Just come up with your idea and then make sure you design what it's actually going to look like and how its function is going to inform the form. Still got that headache? Well, don't worry, I've got you covered. It's actually possible to outsource the process of designing your product and more specifically to crowdsource it, meaning that lots of people submit ideas. Crowdspring, which you'll find here at crowdspring.com, for instance, is a website that allows you to find designers for your projects starting for as little as $7. So you have your idea and you're not sure how to make this into a CAD file you can actually use, then just head over here to get exactly what you need. The platform is geared specifically towards small businesses and entrepreneurs like you and has given life to some popular products such as the Diet Wizard wristband from Blue Nova. A similar option is CAD Crowd, which you'll find here at cadcrowd.com. And this allows you to run contests for CAD designers, wherein you pay only for your favorite designer once several options have been submitted. There's also a more traditional option to pay by the hour, though. For everything else, packaging, branding, etc., you can always use the ever-popular 99designs.com or regional variations like this one here for the UK, 99designs.co.uk. Having a great idea is something you should never underestimate. With the right idea, you have not only got the power to change your life and that of others, but also the power to change the world. The right idea can get you passionate, it can make you rich, and it can make your life easier and better in all sorts of ways. Right now we have an idea of what's possible and what's not, but when we come up with a new idea, a new solution to a common problem, we can change this definition by creating new ways to do things and even creating entirely new things in the first place. But if you want to create a business on the back of your idea, then it's not enough for it to simply be useful or even transformative. Your idea has also got to be profitable. What this means is that your idea needs to be commercially viable. You need to be able to create it in a cost-effective manner so you can charge a reasonable price for it and still make a profit. Likewise, you need your idea to be attractive enough to other people so that they're willing to pay for it. And you may also need it to speak to lenders and investors so that you can get financial backing to go ahead. So how do you know if your idea is really a possible business? And how do you know if your idea is profitable? Well, in order to decide whether or not your business is going to be profitable, you need to look at two things in particular your cost per unit, which tells you how much it's going to cost a manufacturer, and your price. For that first figure, the cost per unit, you need to make sure that you account for every single expense that you will need to make in order to create your products. That doesn't just mean thinking about the cost of manufacturing the item itself, and you can get all that from your manufacturing contractor. It also means finding out how much packaging and instructions are going to cost, how much you're going to spend running your business in that time and how much you're going to spend on labor and how much it's going to cost you to deliver your item, that sort of thing. Likewise, you also need to think about marketing. How much money do you want to spend on making your product known? 
Once you know that, it's now time to work out a price and to see if there's a profit left over for you at the end of the day. Bear in mind that you'll need to work out two prices, one being the wholesale price that you offer to resellers, and the other being the RRP end users will pay for your item. Remember that everyone in the chain also needs to make a profit, so you need to keep your price competitive and do enough market research to ensure people are willing to pay it. If you run these numbers to find that your product isn't going to earn you any money, then don't be disheartened. By tweaking a few elements, you can normally increase your margins. And it's better to find that out now than later. For more free educational content, visit learnforfree.biz. Content produced and distributed by AllSuperInfo.